Well, there are a variety of ways to uh, assess uh, our experience <clears throat> when we come to a church service or we visit maybe another uh, congregation. But the most common question that summarizes the whole thing usually is, what did you get out of it? Yeah, you went to church over at X congregation across town to see what they were doing and you know, uh, was there any different than us? Uh, how was it? What'd you, what'd you get out of it? You know, some people, they leave congregations and, and they seek out new ones with the excuse, well, I just wasn't getting anything out of it, you know, at my church. And so I decided to leave and go see if I could, you know, get something better. Obviously this suggests that people have certain expectations about their church life and and even if they can't describe in detail what it is that they need, they do know that they need something from church. And if they don't receive it, they will quit and go somewhere else. And after 40 years of preaching, I've seen that happen over and over again. Now, the usual answer, and I confess, I've also been guilty of giving this answer, has usually been, you don't come to church to get something, you come to church to give something. Yeah, that, was my, that was my rapid fire answer to anybody who asked me that particular question. Well, this is partly true. Church life is about giving, but it's also about getting as well. And so this morning, I'd like to share with you some of the things the Bible says that we should get from church. So first of all, when we come to worship service, we should get a sense of God's presence. That's something that we should get when we come to a worship service. You know, people come to a church service because they believe in a God that they can't see and they want in some way to have an experience of him. I know that Hebrews 10, 27 tells us, you know, not to forsake the assembling of the saints, but this is not a reason to come. It's just a warning, you know, not to quit coming. Habit or fear is a poor motivator for coming to church because it almost guarantees that we won't experience God, we'll only experience our habit and our fear. Now, the Roman Catholics, you know, they had the idea of this, that you should get something you know, when you go to church. They built huge and magnificent church buildings uh, in the Middle Ages and even, even to this day. And the, the point was that upon entering some towering edifice with gold and other worldly decor, you would have an experience that was unlike any other experience in your life. You know, today you go to Notre Dame, uh, this is a picture of that, uh, and you go, yeah, wow, really nice. Because today we live in a world where there are skyscrapers, you know, 150 stories high and we travel by plane, you know, and we, 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 we can see whole cities you know, from above, the bird's eye view. But imagine in the Middle Ages, where you lived in a one story house and everything was flat, and then you walked into a thing like this here, and you looked up at the spires, and you looked up the ceiling, and you looked at the the paint, they painted on the ceilings, how did they do that? And so on and so forth. The gold and the jewelry and the magnificent artwork. You know, you left feeling that God was majestic and mighty and mysterious. Of course, they had the right idea, but they had, I believe, the wrong method. Because Paul says in Acts chapter 17, verse 29, that the divine nature is not like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art or the thought of man. 
You cannot produce an experience of the spiritual using human physical things. Remember, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The biggest issue in Christianity today revolves around how to have the God experience. Some try to produce it with the art of music and drama and dance, and others rely on the old Catholic method of spectacular uh, architecture, and still others try to generate a high emotional reaction through crowd manipulation and hysteria. It's interesting to note that the first century church had no fancy buildings. They did not use instruments or organized events for worship. They held no public rallies in the style of the modern faith healers. And yet their experience of God was such that they were ready to die for their faith. And many did. They, like us, came to church in order to experience a sense of God. And their deep conviction and martyrdom tells us that they did. And I believe the reason for it was because they were close to Jesus Christ. They were, they were close historically in that Jesus had lived and died and resurrected many of them in their generation. Some of them may have even seen him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. They were close to his teachings because the apostles themselves were their teachers. In Acts 2, where it says, they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The key there, continually devoted themselves to the apostles' uh, teaching. They were close to the past and very much aware of their sins and Jesus' forgiveness. They had lived in total darkness and paganism and Christianity was such a light and such a relief, such a great hope that they never had before. Uh, that Paul tells us in Romans five. They were close to the future because many first century Christians believed that Jesus' coming and the judgment would literally take place in their lifetimes. And so they lived like a people who might be judged and go to heaven next week. So the reason that God became the man, Jesus, was to permit us an experience of him. What did he say to Philip? Have I been with you for so long a time and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And people who say, I didn't get nothing out of it, are saying, show me the Father. Show me the Father. Our church experience should include an experience of the Father, but it's not an experience manufactured through architecture or through emotionalism. It is accessible in the same way now as it was in the first century. And that is through a drawing nearer to Christ through his body, which is the church. For example, the death and burial and resurrection is not in our generation, but the commemoration of it through communion keeps the memory and the meaning fresh in our minds. And the teaching of the apostles are preserved in the Bible and our conviction grows as we learn and as we apply it to our lives today in the same way that they learned it and they applied it to their lives in the first century. The blood of the cross shed so long ago is as effective to wash away our sins today as it ever was. And the joy that comes from forgiveness is as fresh and hopeful as it was in the first century. Do you think the person that was buried in the waters of baptism and all their sins were taken away, that person in the first century, do you think he or she was happier at that moment than we are today when that happens to us? The same forgiveness 
through the same method, through the same Christ is taking place today as it was then. And his return is as imminent as it ever was. There is still no guarantee that we will be alive tomorrow. And so if we don't have the God experience, it may be because we've moved away from Christ in some way. We've moved away from taking the communion regularly. We've, we've moved away from seriously obeying the teachings of the apostles. We've moved away from dealing with and forsaking our sins. We've moved away from a lifestyle that is always ready for his return. If you want to experience the presence of God in church, you must uh, uh, remain in the presence of Christ throughout the week. That's how you have the God experience. You stay close to the Lord throughout the week. And then your songs to the Lord, your remembrance of the Lord, your obedience to the Lord, all of those things will be fresh in your experience when we gather as a church on the Lord's day. Another thing that you should get when you come to church, you should get a sense of direction. You know, there are a million books out there that will try to tell you what to do with your life, but there's only one book that tells you what God wants you to do with your life. When a person leaves a church service, that person should have a sense of where he or she is going. You should get that out of church. I suppose what I'm saying here is aimed more at those who serve as, as elders and ministers and teachers because they're charged with ministering the word of God to the church. You know, when I was in college, my professors would insist that sermons and lessons have a point, that sermons and lessons have a so what, uh, an instruction to the hearer about what he or she uh, needed to do or understand or change. Uh, the reasons for this are evident. When Jesus taught, he taught with a purpose uh, that his hearers would either believe or they would repent or they would follow or they would be comforted or uh, any number of reasons. When people come to church, they're coming for answers. They want direction. They want confirmation. They need encouragement, even need discipline. And when they don't receive any, they feel that their time was wasted. Why did I go? I didn't learn anything. Nobody gave me any direction. I wasn't encouraged. I wasn't comforted. Why should I return? Paul says that all scriptures inspired by God and beneficial for teaching. There's a purpose to it. It's beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. We come to church to be equipped. Sometimes the equipment we're lacking is comfort because we are in pain or we're suffering. But sometimes the thing that we need is a rebuke to be told, stop doing what you're doing, it's wrong. Or start doing this over here because it's the right thing to do. Leaders and ministers and teachers need to make sure that their lessons as well as their lives provide the so what, provide the direction that the church needs in order to be sure of the way that they should walk as Christians. God has given uh, to the government the right and responsibility to keep order and protect society, uh, Romans 13, 1. And God has given to the family, he has given the right and responsibility to establish homes and to raise children, uh, Genesis 2. But only to the church has God given the task of saving souls and providing a more a moral compass to direct the way that God would have us live. You know, in 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul tells us that the church is the pillar and support of truth. We come to church to hear truth, 
uh, truth about my life, truth about what is right, truth about God, truth about the future. We come for truth. We should make no apologies for providing clear and emphatic direction and instructions for godly living. It's what God has given us to do and it's what the church expects when it comes uh, on the Lord's day uh, to gather. And then finally, what do people want to get out of church? Well, they need a sense of belonging. A sense of belonging. You know, in a survey about religion in America, it was noted that the number one thing that people want to get when they come to church, in America anyways, is a sense of belonging. This is not surprising considering the present condition of our society. The traditional extended family is gone. Uh, there's no more grandparents living with you uh, and relatives around you for a lifetime. Uh, people move on an average of every four to five years. Every five years you have to make new friends and get used to a new place. Uh, one out of two marriages are ending in divorce, meaning that there are a lot of single moms and single dads or blended families out there. More people are single longer, widowed longer, living by themselves longer than ever before. The internet is becoming the fastest way to make new virtual friends. So it's not surprising that what people want to get when they come to church is a sense of belonging that for whatever reasons they have not managed to feel in their normal lives. This is a great opportunity for the church because God designed it to be a place where everyone could belong. What does Paul say in Galatians 3? There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He could have said, you all belong in Christ Jesus. Through faith, uh, expressed uh, in repentance and baptism, a person enters the church regardless of his past or wealth or culture. However, in order for a person to feel like he belongs there, the church needs to do several things. Very quickly, in order to make people feel like they belong, we need to make the person feel welcome. We need to get to know. Uh, we need to offer hospitality. We need to greet them warmly. Uh, you know you are welcomed if you feel it. If you feel welcome, then you are welcome. We also need to see uh, to people's uh, needs, physical needs, emotional or spiritual needs. Meeting a person's needs is the surest way to say to them that we want you here. And then thirdly, make people feel useful, integrate a person into our work and into our lives. Uh, people feel they belong when they are serving others within the group. The Jerusalem church did all of these because, <coughs> excuse me, in the book of Acts, what do you see? You see them eating in each other's home. You see them selling goods and sharing the profits uh, to whoever uh, has needs. You see them teaching each other. Uh, you see people sent to preach and feed the poor. You see deacons being appointed. You know, for, for many people, the church is the only real family that they have. And for a growing segment of the population, it's the family that they're looking for. When people come here, they have to feel that they belong here and that they're welcome or they won't stay. And that's just the reality of how things work today. I think there are some legitimate things that we should get out of church when we come. And if we don't get these things, well, there's no reason to stay. So just to review in our minds, when we come to church, we should get a sense of God's presence, that in this place, I come closer to God than at other times or when I'm with other people. We should also get a direction for our lives. 
We might not always agree, but at least the way that we should go has been clearly marked by the preachers and the teachers and the elders. And thirdly, we should get a feeling that we belong here just as much as everybody else. We should never feel like we're an outsider if we are part of the body of Christ. The question is how do we make sure that everyone gets these things when they come? A few suggestions and the lesson is yours. First of all, experiencing God's presence requires my obedience to his word and my drawing closer to his son. You, you want to experience God? This is how to do it. Not new music or new preacher or new building. Those are all needed things uh, you know, as the time arrives. But these are not things that draw us closer to God. A new attitude about my Christianity, that will draw you closer to God. The more we as a group dedicate ourselves to Christ, the more we will experience God's presence, not only in our worship service, but in our everyday life as well. The second thing, direction requires leadership. And in the church, leadership requires much prayer, study, and preparation. People want direction. But we have to be sure that as leaders and teachers and ministers, that the direction that we give is according to God's word and nothing else. There are many directions in life, but we will be judged if the directions we give don't lead to Christ and his kingdom. What, what, was, the, what was the happy story I told you at the beginning? What was the happy part of it? Well, what's so happy about a woman who can't, who can't find a church of Christ? There's nothing happy about that. She has to reach out to some guy on the internet who has to then do a long research to find a group of God's people who are meeting close enough that she can you know, physically go there. There's no, no happy thing about that. And what's happy about her sister who's got a brain tumor and is about to die in the hospital. There's nothing happy about that, nothing. The only happy thing about that whole story is, is Christ, is the gospel that through this you know, long and meandering way, this person found the gospel and then shared it with someone else and both of them obeyed the gospel and were saved. That's the only happy thing in the, in, the, in the whole story. So people want direction, but the direction we need to give is how to draw them closer to Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, belonging happens when each person begins to sense ownership and responsibility for the church. When we go from the church, your church, to my church, when we start saying, well, at my church, or, in, or rather, my congregation, in our congregation, in my congregation, where I am at, where I belong, when we start talking like that, then we start belonging like that. Yes, a warm welcome, a meeting of immediate needs, and something to do says that we want you to belong, but that sense of belonging won't happen until you yourself begin to care about what happens to this church. Uh, I have another happy story, a very brief happy story. I was talking to Charles, one of our members uh, over here. Uh, forgive me, Charles, for using this story, but it, it fits us so well. And we were just chit-chatting together. Uh, you know, where are you from? What do you do for a living? And you know, going back and forth. And, and then I asked him, uh, because he's fairly new uh, to this congregation as a member. I said, what do you do? Not what do you do for a living? What do you do in the church? And he smiled and he said, oh, he says, I work on the baptistry. You know, I make sure that the water level in the baptistry is proper, is okay, and it's working. 
And I said, that's, that's important because when someone says at 11 p.m. on a cold, dark night, you know, I'm ready to be baptized, we don't fool around. We don't say, well, we'll wait till Sunday. No, sir, we jump in the car, we go to the building, turn on the lights, and isn't it great if the water is clean and warm and ready you know, for, that, for that person? And he smiled. And then he said something that made me happy. And he said, well, that's what I'm doing now because I haven't been given any other responsibilities. I look forward to doing more. There's the attitude of belonging. You know, I've known some people for 20, 30 years in this church that never ever said that to me. <laughs> I'm looking forward to doing more. What a wonderful, happy attitude. So a sense of belonging won't happen until you yourself begin to care about what happens to this church, that you care enough to welcome others, that you care enough to support it financially, that you care enough to maintain and serve it, that you care enough to want others to belong here and care like you care. You know you belong uh, when you care for others like others cared for you when you first came. Do these things and you'll get what you need out of church. Of course, one thing everyone needs to get whether they come to church uh, is the chance to be right with God. And as in every service, we offer that opportunity now. If you're not a Christian and would like to be right with God and have your sins forgiven and receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then we know the water is ready. And we encourage you to come this morning repenting of your sins and be immersed in Christ that you might belong to his body. And if you are a Christian that needs a, a new start or a prayer for forgiveness or a word of encouragement, a prayer of encouragement, well, our elders are ready to serve you now. We encourage you to make your way forward or let your wishes be known as we stand now and as we sing our song of encouragement.